the joint work with Ani Bapa, Andrew Childs, Alexei Gorshkov, and Eddie Shauta at the University of Maryland. Um, it's based on uh, two results, one uh, in preparation, which will be out soon, hopefully this week, um, and one that's actually just out today. Um, so uh, before I tell you what routing is, maybe I'll tell you why you should care about it. So um, let's say you have a goal of running a quantum algorithm on some quantum device, and a theorist gives you a quantum circuit. Um, but typically, theorists don't think too much about connectivity constraints. So they're going to give you a circuit that just has gates that are all over the place using qubits that are in no way connected. Um, and this is a problem because scalable architectures uh, require us to um, obey connectivity constraints on qubits. So for example, here's IBM's heavy hex lattice where qubits are arranged um, on the vertices. So more formally, so more formally, we can describe um, our qubit connectivity constraints in the form of a graph where your vertices are your qubits and the edges represent pairs of qubits between which you're allowed to apply quantum gates. Um, so for example, in this particular graph, you'd be allowed to perform a unitary gate between qubits three and five because they're connected by an edge, but you would not be allowed to perform a gate between qubits four and 10 because that would not obey your connectivity constraints. So when we have such constraints, how do we describe a computational model? So the way we talk about computation on such architectures is in the form of what we call an architecture respecting evolution, uh, where we have a normalized time dependent Hamiltonian and um, the Hamiltonian it has terms that are only supported on edges of our graph. And a special case of this would be if we did a quantum circuit um, where we only have gates that lie on edges of our graph. So our goal is given an arbitrary quantum circuit that is a circuit that has, um, that has gates between qubits that are not necessarily connected, we want to produce an equivalent time evolution or an equivalent circuit that respects the connectivity of our graph. Um, and in particular, we want to be able to come up with this mapping um, efficiently. And we also want to ensure that however we do the mapping, we minimize our depth and time, uh, our depth, time, or space overhead. So here's an example of how you might do something like that. So here's a circuit on the left, which doesn't respect a nearest neighbor's connectivity. Um, in particular, it has these two long range gates that are uh, between qubits that are far away. And uh, a sort of naive way you might do this would be by inserting swap gates. So now we have the circuit on the right, which is entirely local. Uh, all the gates are between neighboring qubits. Um, and we incurred a depth overhead by adding these swap gates. So a nice way to think about this as a black box task is uh, to describe it in terms of permuting locations of qubits, which is what we call routing. So routing is exactly this task. Given a particular permutation on a graph, we want to implement the mapping that, um, that permutes the qubits in that way. Um, and this is a well-studied problem classically. It comes up in the context of classical networks and optical networks. Um, so there are classical algorithms to do this routing. Um, and in particular, uh, a seminal result from Alan Chung and Graham shows that on any graph, you can do any permutation in linear time. Uh, that is time linear in the number of vertices of your graph. Um, so here are the big questions that I'm gonna try and uh, give some insight into today. So first, we, um, since we have the ability to do more general quantum operations than just swaps, we want to understand if we can possibly permute qubits faster by using more general quantum operations. And second, if we can get speed ups by using more general quantum operations, what kind of bounds and limitations can we place on them? And in particular, what kinds of permutations and what kind of graphs can we achieve this kind of speed up for? So um, now we can define the problem of routing in a quantum context. So it's essentially the same thing where we have some permutation, except now we want to implement it using an architecture respecting uh, Hamiltonian evolution. We also consider more restricted models, such as models where um, we're only allowed to do gates, that is, we have an architecture respecting circuit. And we also consider more powerful models, such as models where we have um, the ability to use ancillas, uh, fast measurement and classical feedback, or local operations and classical communication. In particular, the ability to do local operations in classical communication, or LOCC, um, allows us to perform quantum teleportation in constant depth, which will be a very powerful routing primitive. So here's a summary of what we discussed so far. Um, real scalable quantum architectures have qubit connectivity constraints 
which uh, prevent us from doing arbitrary gates on arbitrary pairs of qubits. Um, so whatever algorithms we want to run on real architectures have to respect these uh, connectivity constraints. And a very natural way to think about doing this is by permuting qubits. Classically, this is well studied and there's uh, linear time algorithms to do uh, this routing using just swap gates. But since we have the ability to do more general quantum operations, we want to see if we can get a speed up of these classical methods. Um, so we have two goals. One, uh, the first goal is to obtain uh, speed ups using uh, operations like gates, Hamiltonian evolution, and LLCC. And as a related goal, uh, both of these go hand in hand. We want to find bounds on the speed ups, and these both inform each other. So whenever we encounter a speed up, typically um, we encounter some kind of bound that's being broken by a particular routing model. Um, and when, whenever we come up with a bound, uh, we often find a related speed up. So here's the outline of uh, the rest of my talk. Um, first, I'll talk about some lower bounds on both classical and quantum routing. Then I'm going to give an example of a, a speed up using Hamiltonian evolution augmented with the ability to use ancillas. And then I'm going to dive deep into the use of ancillas along with LOCC um, to talk about teleportation routing and where we can get teleportation routing speed ups. Finally, I'm going to uh, bound the separation between teleportation based routing and classical swap based routing um, and uh, discuss some open questions about where we could possibly get bigger speed ups. So first, let's talk about lower bounds on quantum routing. Um, so uh, first, a little bit of notation. So uh, we define the routing time as for a graph and a permutation as the minimum time of an architecture respecting evolution that implements that particular permutation on that graph. And we also overload the notation a bit. So the routing time for a graph is defined as uh, the maximum overall permutations. That is the time for the hardest or the worst permutation. Um, and we can define a similar routing time in the gate-based model, as well as the classical model. So in the gate-based model, it's the time for the depth of an architecture respecting circuit. And in the uh, classical routing model, it's the time of a swap circuit. So um, the first lower bound we have is a diametric lower bound on the routing time. So um, in any graph, the distance between a pair of vertices is the, just the length of the shortest path connecting them. And the diameter of a graph is the longest such path. That is the maximized path over all vertices of the shortest path. Um, so from, from, from the diameter of a graph, we immediately get a lower bound on the routing time. Um, because uh, in the case of Hamiltonian routing, this follows from Lee Robinson bounds. So it's, it's a light cone-based argument. Um, and in the case of uh, swap-based routing and gate-based routing, it follows from the fact that um, a gate can only move a qubit one edge at a time. So if we wanted to move a distance across a diameter, we'd have to go one step at a time. Um, another bound uh, can be described in terms of the expansion properties of our graph. So uh, before I talk about expansion properties, let me define what a graph partition is. So a graph partition is when we take our graph and we split it into two sets of vertices. And for any such partition, uh, the quantities of interest to us are the boundaries of the partition. So in particular, we have delta x, which is uh, the vertex boundary, and we have e of x, which is the edge boundary of any partition. Um, and we're gonna use the size of this boundary to uh, lower bound the routing time. Um, so the first, uh, the first bound on gate-based routing follows from uh, what's called small total entangling, which essentially tells us that if we apply uh, any unitary that acts only on the boundary of some partition, x and x bar, then the maximum entanglement entropy that unitary can generate across that partition is just proportional to the size of, of the support on that boundary. So any unitary that you wanted to do between x and x bar to possibly generate entanglement um, would only be able to generate an amount of entanglement proportional to the size of the vertex boundary. Um, so here's how we uh, use that result to uh, give a lower bound on the routing time. So let's imagine we have some partition x and x bar, um, and we initialize all our qubits to have some secret hidden uh, ancilla and to be in a bell pair. Now, before we start uh, any routing, um, there's no entanglement entropy across our partition because all the ancillas are local on each, on each side. So what we do is um, we do a permutation that maps everything from x into x bar and everything from x bar into x. So when we're done with that permutation, the entanglement entropy across this partition has now increased by the size or by the number of vertices that we moved across. 
Um, but from our earlier bound, we know that at any one time step, the maximum amount of entropy that we can generate across the partition is only proportional to the size of the boundary. So to generate uh, an X amount of entropy, uh, when we can only generate delta X in one time step is gonna take us X over delta X time steps. Um, and in particular, since we're interested in uh, the worst case routing time over all possible permutations, um, we can maximize over all the partitions uh, to obtain a lower bound in terms of what is called the vertex expansion of the graph. So this vertex expansion is a measure of, of the bottlenecktedness of our graph. So it kind of tells us like how, how tight our vertex boundaries are. And it's a measure of like the worst boundary and like the worst set of vertices that you might possibly have to route all of your other vertices through. Um, and we can define a similar lower bound for the Hamiltonian based routing time. Um, and this follows from what's called small incremental entangling. Um, except now this lower bound is defined not in terms of the vertex boundary, but in terms of the edge boundary. And, and the logic here is that your Hamiltonian would only be supported on the edges. And uh, since we restrict ourselves to normalized Hamiltonians, um, you can only generate a certain rate of entanglement uh, through a certain number of edges. Um, and crucially, there's a difference between the edge boundary and the vertex boundary. And in particular, the edge-based lower bound is always um, looser than the vertex-based lower bound. So this is a possible area where we might get a speed up from using Hamiltonian-based routing over gate-based or swap-based routing. So here's an example of how we might achieve such a speed up. So this is what's called the vertex barbell graph, which you can think of as two complete graphs with one single vertex joining them. Um, so this graph is like very poorly connected in terms of vertex boundaries, because if I say wanted to do a, a cut that um, moved everything from the left graph to the right graph, they would all have to pass through a single central vertex. And since that vertex can only support um, one qubit at a time, with, with gate-based routing, it's gonna take me linear time. And that's of course tight because we know that there's a classical algorithm that also does this in linear time. Um, on the other hand, if we look at the Hamiltonian based routing time, um, the, this graph is not very poorly bound in terms of edges. Like it's, it's well connected in terms of edges, if not vertices. Um, so we only get a trivial lower bound for the Hamiltonian routing time, which is just a constant because the edge boundaries are all big. Um, so uh, I won't get into the details, but uh, if, if you augment your Hamiltonian routing model with the ability to use Encelas, which allows us to you know, hide away qubits in intermediate stages, um, then with Hamiltonians, you can route in root n time, whereas with gates, it would take you time n. So we have this uh, quadratic speed up. So uh, here's a summary of everything discussed so far. Um, we talked about how classical routing can be done in linear time using swap networks. Um, we talked about lower bounds on gate-based and Hamiltonian-based routing in terms of the expansion properties of our graph. Um, and we gave an example of a quadratic speedup uh, from the use of Hamiltonian evolution along with Ancillas. Um, so now that we know that we can get a speedup using Ancillas, we want to see how far we can take that. Um, and in particular, what if we allow ourselves to measure uh, the Ancillas and do quantum operations that are conditioned on those measurement outcomes? Um, in particular, we're no longer bound by that diameter lower bound on the routing time because the ability to do these uh, conditioned gates um, essentially allows us to do non-local operations. In particular, this allows us to do quantum teleportation in constant depth using what's called a repeater protocol, which essentially uses entanglement swapping. You can think of this as doing many teleportations uh, almost in parallel. And at the end, we just have to do uh, a single qubit gate controlled on parity outcomes of the measurement. Um, so some more details about how, how we would choose to model this in a routing context. Um, so we, we're in a setting where, where qubits are hard to generate. So we want to use as many qubits as possible for computational purposes and as few as possible for just ancillas. Um, so in particular, we only allow a constant number of ancillary qubits per data qubit and our ancillary qubits are locally attached. Um, and we also consider the, the time for measurement and classically controlled single qubit gates to be constant. So it takes the same time as doing a two qubit gate. Um, and the fact that we only have a constant number of ancillas restricts us in some sense because it means we can't do arbitrary teleportations um, because the teleportations uh, in this repeater protocol have to go along a certain path. And since we only have a constant number of ancillas per vertex, um, we can't have too many paths intersecting on any one vertex. 
Um, and also the expansion based bounds from before still apply uh, even to the case where we have LOCC. So here's an obvious example of how you might get a speed up from using teleportation based routing. Uh, now we get a diametric speed up. So consider a path graph and we just want to swap the two vertices that are furthest away from each other. Um, if you wanted to do this with Hamiltonians or with swaps, you have to go one at a time and move things all the way to the middle, swap them, and then move them all the way back. But if you were doing this with teleportation, you could just do it in constant depth. Um, and in fact, you can get speed ups even when you have a small diameter in your graph. So consider, for example, the wheel graph. So this graph has a diameter of two, uh, so it's constant. So we have one vertex in the center and we have uh, n vertices along the rim of a wheel. So now let's consider a permutation that takes root n vertices that are all spaced out at a distance root n, so equally spaced out on the rim of the wheel. Um, so if you wanted to do this permutation with uh, swaps, you would either have to move uh, your qubits through the central vertex, or you'd have to move them along the outer rim. But if you want to move them through the central vertex, you can kind of only go one at a time. And if you want to move them along the outer rim, you have to move a distance root n. So uh, whatever you do, the swap-based routing time on this graph is going to be at least root n. Whereas I can just do teleportation in parallel across all of these paths because they're all disjoint, they don't intersect. Um, so in, in a constant depth, I can, I can just teleport uh, everything to its destination. So on this graph, I can, I can route with teleportation in constant time. So the examples I discussed earlier are actually not the hardest permutations on their particular graphs. So consider, for example, on the path graph, what if you just wanted to move every qubit on the left side to the right side and everything on the right side to the left side? Um, even with teleportation, this would take you a linear amount of time because you have a bottleneck in the center of your graph. So the question we want to answer is, can we get improvements even for the hardest permutations? Um, and in particular, we look at what's called the teleportation advantage which is uh, the ratio of the routing time, that is the worst case time for the hardest permutations uh, for swaps versus for teleportation. Um, and it's not obvious that this quantity advantage should be greater than one at all. Um, you might think that every graph is gonna have some pathologically bad permutation even for teleportation-based routing. And in particular, this is true for many common types of graphs such as hypercubes and grids um, and graphs like expanders. Um, but in fact, we do show a graph that has a logarithmic separation between teleportation-based routing and swap-based routing. So this graph has a diameter that is a log. It's essentially arranged like a ladder where each level um, is a complete graph and everything is well connected to the next level. Um, and the structure of this graph lets you do teleportation, um, lets you come up with an algorithm that can do any permutation in constant time using teleportation but we have this diametric lower bound on swap-based routing, so there's a logarithmic separation. Um, so what if we want to find an even bigger separation? Like, we're not satisfied with just log. Um, so to find a graph which possibly offers a bigger teleportation advantage, we need to understand uh, what limits teleportation speedups and why we can't have arbitrary speedups using teleportation. Um, and in particular, we'll try to answer this by looking at uh, simulating a general teleportation protocol using only swaps and ancillas. Um, so first, I'd like to describe a fast sparse routing algorithm. So what is sparse routing? Sparse routing is when you only want to route a subset of your vertices. In this case, we're only routing k vertices. Um, so we show an algorithm that lets you route k vertices in time big O of k plus the diameter of the graph. And the way we do this is sort of by compressing and decompressing. The idea is um, in time proportional to the diameter of the graph, you bring all of the vertices you're trying to route uh, to span some subgraph in the middle of your graph. And then using the classical fast uh, swap-based algorithm, uh, you just do whatever permutation you need to you need to do in the center. And then finally, you just move everything back uh, to the targets and in time proportional to the diameter. Okay, so how do we use this to simulate a teleportation protocol using swaps? So uh, first, we know that every teleportation protocol consists of many disjoint paths or almost disjoint paths, that is paths that only intersect a constant number of times per vertex, which follows, of course, from, um, from the fact that we only have a constant number of ancillas per vertex. So what we do is we take all these paths from whatever teleportation protocol we're trying to simulate, and we split them into two sets. Uh, we split them into the short paths, that is all the paths that are length below some cutoff L, and all the long paths that are paths above that cutoff. So for everything that's below the cutoff length, we just swap along the given paths, and that takes time proportional uh, to L, where, where L is the length of those paths. 
Um, and now we look at all the long paths and by a pigeonhole principle-based argument, um, if we're trying to put many long paths on a graph which only has n vertices, and we insist that they don't intersect too many times per vertex, that tells us that there can only be um, big O of n over l such paths. Um, and since, uh, since we only have O of n over l such paths, now we can just use uh, the sparse routing algorithm to route whatever vertices lie, uh, lay on that path. Um, so that can be done in time uh, proportional to the diameter plus n over l. Finally, just combining that, combining both stages of this process, uh, it takes time L plus N over L plus the diameter. So we can optimize our cutoff length L to be root N, which gives us this upper bound on the teleportation advantage for any permutation. Um, but in practice, we can't actually even achieve uh, such a large speed up. And the reason for that is because to make this very large, you would need to make your diameter very big. But um, by creating a very large diameter graph, we uh, end up introducing bottlenecks into our graph. And you can kind of think of it, think of it as when you stretch out your graph, you're necessarily making the middle parts thinner. Um, so what is the biggest possible separation we can get? So we show that the maximum separation you can get using teleportation is proportional to root n log n um, for over all possible graphs. And the way we show this is by uh, combining our earlier bound, which is the diameter plus root n, um, with lower bounds in terms of the uh, expansion properties, which apply even to teleportation-based routing. Um, so we use this idea of a trade-off between the diameter and the expansion properties. That is to say, when the diameter is big, we know there's a tighter bottleneck, vice versa. Um, so we combine those results, and then uh, maximizing over all possible graphs, we find that when a graph has a vertex expansion proportional to root of log n over n, then the most speed up we could possibly get is root n log n, and any other graph would have a smaller speed up. Uh, so uh, in conclusion, uh, these are the results we showed. Uh, so we showed lower bounds on the gate-based and Hamiltonian-based routing time. Um, we showed an example where Hamiltonians, along with Ancillas, had a speed up over gate-based and swap-based methods. Um, for teleportation, we showed an example uh, of a graph which has a worst-case separation for uh, teleportation versus swaps. Um, and we also gave a bound on the maximum possible worst-case separation of O root n log n. And we also showed an algorithm that using just swaps could simulate any teleportation protocol. Uh, so finally, some open questions. Uh, on the right, we have um, our hierarchy of routing models. Um, and some of these boundaries are you know, sharper than other boundaries, and some of them are uh, still not entirely clear. Um, so we're still looking for a separation between, a super constant separation between swaps and just gates without any ancillas and without any LOCC. Um, we're also interested in finding even bigger separations using teleportation, um, which goes hand in hand with finding tighter bounds uh, on teleportation. Um, and I personally think we can move both ways. So we have this uh, root of n log n upper bound and we have a log n separation. So it's, it, it should be possible to get an even bigger separation and an even tighter bound. Um, and we're also interested in, in, this, in uh, going outside of the routing context and using LOCC to its full power uh, to do this task of general unitary synthesis. In particular, um, there are results showing that you, know, you can do an unbounded can out gate in constant depth using uh, LOCC, and you can do things like state preparation, so W state preparation, GHC preparation. You can prepare states that have long range entanglement, uh, states with interesting topological properties. So LOCC is a very powerful primitive. Um, that could be applied to the general task of unitary synthesis. Thanks. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned like, earlier in the talk that you have these low bound based on the expansion properties of the graph. Is your sense of that that those are likely to be tight, or are there examples of like good expanders that you think will be hard for either the swap based or the other kind of graphing methods? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, for one, for many common classes of graphs, like those are those bounds are tight. So, like grids or hypercubes, they are tight. Um, and also, like if you have graphs that are good expanders, I didn't show it here, but um, we have results that for, for graphs with good expansion properties, you can do uh, much faster swap-based routing algorithms using uh, sort of random walk arguments. 
Um, so, so for a lot of graphs that have like a nice structure to them, and for many graphs like expanders, um, you can actually come up with fast swap-based algorithms. So there's less room for a separation. In particular, we show that um, if your graph is a good expander or like a really bad expander, you can't get much of a speed up using teleportation. <laughs> uh, do the swap base? Well, it depends on your graph. So, you know, we're we're dealing with like multiple axes here, right? It's like on the one hand, we we have permutations, and we try to understand those in terms of worst case permutations. But you know, there are many other permutations you might be interested in. Um, there's many different kinds of graphs, so it, it depends on the graph. But for a lot of common graphs that we know and care about. Um, yeah, swaps do saturate the lower bounds. Yep. Uh, yep. So I'm curious about the uh, this idea of getting more unitary synthesis to other things. So it sounds like like measurement based quantum computing would be like an example of that. Yeah. So me measurement based quantum computing is kind of uh, an inspiration for that, but we're sort of interested in the setting where we don't allow like a large number of ancillas. So if you were doing it in like a measurement based framework, you you do have like a a large ancillary overhead, um, but we're kind of interested in the setting where, you know, it's it's hard to make qubits, right? So you want to use as many of them for computational purposes as possible. Um, so I guess, for example, you can do like fan out. So fan out, unbounded fan out is like a C naught with multiple targets. So you can do that in constant depth using uh, using only a linear number of insulas, that is, constant number of insulas per data qubit. Yep. Yep. So for regular graphs, because usually probably it's not going to be a qubit that is going to be connected to other qubits, but you know, mm -hmm. very different things make sense. It makes sense or not going to have that specific. Um, I think it depends on the expansion properties. I don't think we've like ruled out a speed up for regular graphs. Um, like the example we had, which was uh, this this ladder graph, you know, is, it's it's not regular at all. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is a good question to to understand. Like, could you get a speed up even on regular graphs? Yeah. Right. Yep. It sounds like you're only considering a single permutation at a time. That when you're doing routes for the quantum circuit, for the ones who like do a permutation and then the graph is going to type change, which did some swaps, do some model stuff. So you really have a sequence of permutations where the previous one affects which one to do next. Yeah, that's, that's right. You're considering your models as well. So we, we're only looking at this black box task of like doing a single permutation at a time. But yeah, in practice, you might want to optimize over the entire circuit. Um, but you very quickly run into like very hard problems when you're doing this. Like even with swaps, it's like hard to come up with like, you know, what, what the optimal swap network is. You can maybe come close. There's, you know, approximation algorithms. Um, but, but these things are often like actually computationally hard. And I think there are some results like showing how, um, like finding the most efficient circuit mapping at every step put all together uh, is probably NP hard or something like that. Okay, any more questions? If not, I think we uh, thank the speaker again.